where you want to go. Great. Do you want to sit here and then come up with the rest of the party? I think that's what I wanted to do. Okay, good. To do things, yes, 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 that's fine. Sure. Yeah, you can do the corner here, and then that's very, yeah. So good morning. Welcome to this important meeting and conversation. As you can see in the pictures around this room, this is a room that's had many important and historic conversations. And we join today for another one. We're pleased to have you here for a conversation on how we can work together to fulfill the commitment of quality primary health care by supporting community workers and community health platforms. I would like to uh, recognize the organizations supporting this, and so on behalf of the communities at the heart of the Universal Health Coverage Campaign, Last Mile Health, Living Goods, and What to Expect Project, Welcome and good morning. I'm Lois Kwam, the CEO and president of Pathfinder. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Murtala Mai, and we are proud to be a part of this, uh, of this work. As you know well in this room, the WHO estimates that about half of the world's population in low, middle, and high-income countries lack full coverage for essential health services. September's high-level meeting on universal health care has the potential to change the health and lives of millions of people around the world, especially women and adolescents who we are here to talk about today. Because so many people, especially women and adolescents, can't afford quality primary care. We also have the potential to improve the lives of women who are the majority of the global workforce in health and social care. Women currently deliver health care to over 5 billion people. We know that community health workers serve as a crucial and trusted local caregiver serving their community and linking their community to the larger primary health care system. Put simply, these dedicated individuals are in the front, in the very front, at the front line of saving lives, and ultimately fulfilling the collective promise we have of healthcare for all. When properly supported, when integrated with the rest of the healthcare system, community healthcare workers dramatically improve maternal and child healthcare around the world. Community-based primary health care ensures women and their partners can plan their families when they can provide comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services. These workers deserve to be fully accredited. They deserve to be a fully accredited part, a fully accredited cadre in all the member states, and they need and deserve a living wage. Community health workers need access to a reliable supply chain and need to be integrated with the rest of the healthcare system. So today we're going to talk about best practices and how we can better support these important and courageous health workers to deliver for their communities. For instance, it's essential that we advocate for national policies and programs that strengthen community engagement. This includes building the capacity of civil society organizations and local partners to advance public health care programs, including comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care services. Ultimately, citizens need to demand services and hold their health systems accountable. This includes the design and the use of mechanisms that allow for stronger community voices and participation. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our moderator. But before I do so, I want to share with you that I've concluded, as I know many others have, that universal health coverage will not and cannot be achieved 
without addressing the equality of women, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and the role of women in the global health workforce. UHC 2030, on behalf of the universal coverage community, has issued six strong asks to member states. They've issued these in advance of the September United Nations high-level meeting. And we support these six asks, and we thank UHC 2030 for their work. However, we regret that their work doesn't specifically include a focus on women. It is almost as if women are treated as a special interest group or a vulnerable population to be served. But frankly, we are neither. We are not a special interest group. We are over half of humanity. We are humanity. And we are not vulnerable. We have delivered every person at this meeting and every person on this earth. That is true power. <laughs> the problem has been that our health concerns have been left to us, regarded as a private matter, regarded as something that we care for in secret at times and by ourselves, not as a matter of policy, not with the attention and the resources flowing to it. And that is what must change. That has happened because throughout history, we've rarely been at the table when the decisions about policies and resources are made. And that has got to change. Our healthcare needs are so foundational. Our healthcare needs need to be a matter of public policy and need to be a location for public resources. They cannot be a private matter. And they need to, those decisions about policies and resources need to be made in settings where women have a strong and equal voice so that they're made in ways that protect our freedoms and protect our opportunity to live our full potential in life. Community and health workers understand this, frankly, because most of them are women. And at the moments where we struggle in our most private and, and challenging, vulnerable times, in most of the world, they are the people who have held our hands. Gender equality and women's health and comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services and rights are so foundational to the achievement of universal health coverage that they merit a mention and action in the fundamental ask going to the United Nations. So we encourage all of you today to call in heads of state your governments, and others to adopt the seventh ask and to accelerate the progress towards universal coverage by establishing the rightful focus on women. And this is a good transition to my introduction of our moderator. Rupa Dot is executive director and one of the co-founders of the Women in Global Health Organization. This is a movement that strives to bring greater gender equality to global health leadership. So when the decisions are made, we as women are at the table. I've watched as this organization grow, has grown and, and met with members uh, in Washington, where I live. And I'm so proud that Pathfinder became an early supporter. Women in Global Health has been in coalition with other very important organizations like Women Deliver, and the International Women's Health Coalition in calling for this seventh ask for universal health care coverage that includes women. These three organizations have launched a new alliance for gender equality and universal health coverage, and we at Pathfinder, Pathfinder have been very proud to join them. We encourage everyone here today and your colleagues to join us in calling on heads of state and national governments to accelerate progress 
towards universal health care by agreeing to the seventh ask and to the role of women in this work. So Rupa, I want to thank you for your leadership, and you bring always such a uh, energy and enthusiasm to this work personally, and we appreciate this because all of us who are women leaders know it's never easy. So thank you for all that you do to make it feel so good. Thank you. Crystal. Um, I'd like to ask Anrudha Gupta, Gupta um, who's currently at Gavi, to please join us on stage. Great. Next, I'd like to ask um, Alberta Freeman. Uh, Alberta is uh, actually someone who is quite special because we had the chance to celebrate her in addition to the role that she plays in Liberia, uh, particularly uh, providing uh, care in some of the toughest uh, areas. She's also a heroines of health. So Alberta, looking forward to you. And as we know, we cannot have this conversation without really having perspectives of member states who really have the tough challenge of negotiating um, these issues for us, but also just really, they're the ones that are responsible for implementing and the ones that uh, really, um, it's great to have countries really being part of the conversation. So I'd like to ask Teskman Ayu, who's uh, currently the Director of Health Extension and Ministry of Health Ethiopia. Finally, but not least, I'd like to invite Annie Toro. She's currently the executive director of What to Expect Project. Annie. Thank you for joining everyone on stage. I didn't get a chance to provide an in-depth bio of everyone, but because we really want to make today about really a conversation and a conversation about how do we really uh, bring and put communities at the heart of UHC, and particularly women and adolescents, how do we really tap into the potential in this room? Um, we know there's an immense amount of power in this room. Um, there's a multiplier effect when we start looking at women as drivers of health, women as change agents, uh, but also just really investing in the health needs of the entire population. Um, so I'm actually gonna begin foremost by um, asking the question of, um, to Rita, like how are you working on delivering universal health coverage for women and adolescents? Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes, my name is Rita. I come from Uganda, and I work as a community health worker with the Ministry of Health with support from Living Goods. I've spent five years 
doing this work. And what do we do? In my community, what we do, we move door to door, improving and saving lives of children under five and pregnant women. Uh, in, in, pregnant, in young children, our target is on malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea. What do we do? Uh, as community health workers, we assess, we treat, we refer, and then we follow up. Then we are being good that we are provided with the teaching aid which we use in our communities, whereby all the topics which we need to share in the communities are provided in this, te in this what? teaching aid. Not only this, we are also provided by the phones, whereby the phones has made our work easy. On our day when we went out, we, we did family registrations. And in my community, I oversee 400 families, and they are all registered here. And this registration continues because new members come in the community and then they do shift. So registration continues. Now when I go into a family, I just tap in that family and the, all the family members come. So if there is a, chick, a sick child, I just tap in that sick child. Then the, this phone, there is a doctor in this phone. I really appreciate for that. Because when you tap there, the whole family comes, you tap in the child, and then the very questions come, asking you, how old is the child? Has the child got malaria, pneumonia, or diarrhea? So when you follow the procedures rightly, the, what? the right dose comes. So still, we do, I told you, our target student under five and pregnant women. So in women, we teach them our most important work is to teach, educate, so that these people may come out well. We teach the pregnant women how they should attend the antenatals. We also teach them about how they, 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 the feeding, how they should feed. We also advise them on how they can protect themselves. And we strongly advise them to deliver at the health, what? health centers. Not only that, we also teach about family planning, telling them how many children they should produce, when, and when to stop. So we do have the, we teach them about the different methods. As we community health workers, we do apply the cyanopress, the pills, and the condoms, and the rest methods, we refer them at the health centers. So that's what we do at the communities down there, but door to door, moving door to door improving and saving their lives. That's our workers, community health workers. Thank you, thank you, Rita, for sharing that. You know, you've already changed the narrative of how people view community health workers. You talked about not only going in to communities and pro using tools and educating, but really also, um, you know, giving and uh, making sure that people have deeper understanding of health and how to take care of themselves. So that, that was that was incredible uh, story that you just shared about your experiences. I'd like to turn next to um, Anuruddha. Anuruddha is a deputy CEO of Gavi, but in addition to that, um, she also brings a perspective of working in one of the largest countries in the world. Uh, formerly, uh, she was the secretary at the Indian Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and she was a mission director of the National Health Mission where she ran the largest and possibly the most complex public health program in the world with an annual budget of 3.5 billion. There she's led doing work, particularly for mothers and children, uh, particularly with the focus of family planning and uh, really this is an area that she knows how to take on some of the toughest challenges. Uh, so Anruda, from both the perspective of Gavi and sort of your long career um, in working in complex health systems, um, what would you say, how are you working to deliver universal health coverage for women and adolescents? So thank you, Rupa, and good morning to all of you. Uh, from my perspective, uh, universal health coverage essentially boils down to two things. 
One is universality and equity in coverage of essential uh, health interventions uh, with uh, uh, quality of delivery. And, uh, and second really is financial protection. And I think what we have been able to achieve uh, with Gavi's uh, support to countries uh, is a, a stupendous success on, on both fronts. Why do I say that? Because immunization is one primary healthcare intervention which is focused, as you know, on, on prevention, but which really is the most equitable uh, health intervention among all MNCH uh, sort of uh, package of services. Uh, uh, and when I'm saying equitable, I'm talking about uh, differential across income groups. So if you really look at the highest wealth quintile and the lowest wealth quintile, the differential that you see really is the lowest uh, on immunization front compared to several other uh, MNCH interventions like skilled birth attendance, access to contraception, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second is that uh, the mean coverage of immunization in 68 Gavi-supported countries, and mind you, these are countries which are the poorest countries of the world, is 87%. So really, the, the other interventions are lagging behind, mostly with, with, with a mean coverage of less than 50%. So you can see that immunization in many ways is a pathfinder among primary healthcare interventions. If you look at the reach of immunization and really the equity that it is able to achieve, why? Why is that the case? I have often asked myself this question, and one hypothesis that I have is that this is because immunization actually is offered through public health system and free of charge. So it does not pose that difficult question of, of uh, allocation of scarce resources at the household level. So clearly, you know, when, when, when a family is deciding, you know, about priority, of, of uh, household expenditures, I think it is, it is easy for them to bring their children for immunization because there are no out-of-pocket payments in most cases. And, and I think that has been a big driver of, of uh, uh, universality and equity that we see on immunization front. Therefore, I genuinely believe that immunization is now really purged as, as a stepping stone to, to universal health coverage for the remaining health interventions. Uh, we stay very alive now to the, to the imperative of taking immunization to the last 13% or 15% uh, children that, that we are still missing. Now coming to your specific question, around women and adolescents, uh, I, I really uh, feel so good sharing it with this group that immunization is also one of the most gender equal uh, interventions in, in health space. Uh, and uh, it is delightful because you know that on other fronts, you see a lot of uh, gender disparity. And again, I'm coming back to the same issue that if you don't have uh, the financial costs associated with an intervention, I think this whole issue of whether you know, you would prioritize boys' health over girls' health does not arise in many cases. And therefore, you see that, you know, girls are also being brought uh, to, for immunization uh, at the same level as, as boys. And how have we reached this conclusion that, that immunization is the most gender equal uh, intervention in health space? Because at Gavi, we have aggressively, aggressively monitored uh, sex disaggregated data in terms of access to immunization. I remember when Gavi uh, instituted uh, this data point, you know, there were, there were a few murmurs, you know, there would be additional burden on countries to report sex disaggregated uh, coverage rates. But uh, as you said, I, I think now, it is important for us uh, to, to look at uh, measurement around, around uh, women, girls, you know, because uh, uh, as uh, Melinda said very recently, data can be very sexist. And, and you really have scarcity of data around uh, women and girls. And that, in a way, shows you the importance that society places on, on, on women and, and girls. The second issue really is about, uh, so we want to now move uh, beyond uh, access to immunization. Uh, to really gender-related barriers. And that is what uh, we have started to increasingly do. Because we do recognize that in most Gavi-supported countries, mothers are often the primary 
caregivers and they face a variety of uh, uh, barriers which can actually impede them for bringing both boys and girls for, for immunization. One of them really is low agency. If, if women uh, uh, don't have uh, power over uh, decision making, uh, they don't have money uh, to travel to uh, hospitals or health facilities or immunization uh, sessions, they don't have the permission of their family or, or their husbands, you know, they don't have time because they're just so busy with household chores, you really find uh, women are uh, unable uh, to, to bring their uh, children for immunization. Even something as simple as the timing of immunization can be a huge barrier because if during daytime poor women are out working, they can hardly afford to forego their daily wage. And, and if an immunization is happening at 11 o'clock in the morning, clearly a mother is unable to bring her children. So these are very fine and sharp uh, lenses that we have started to bring to our uh, service delivery uh, design. And just the last point I would want to make is that Gavi is also very focused on vaccines which are really pro 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 women and pro gender. Uh, one of our biggest um, uh, programs now is around HPV. Uh, you know that uh, now more women are dying of cervical cancer than than women dying uh, in uh, because of childbirth related complications. And 266,000 uh, children die, uh, uh, women die uh, because of cervical cancer. And this number is set to rise and more than 90 percent of these deaths are in developing countries so we really want to scale up HPV which is uh, about adolescent girls and we are trying to make sure that HPV becomes indeed a platform for a lot of integrated uh, services around uh, adolescent girls and their health menstrual hygiene nutrition reproductive sexual health and and things like that uh, people don't uh, know but there is some fresh evidence suggesting that that, you know, diseases can also be uh, quite discriminatory. Uh, there is some very interesting and revealing uh, information uh, that measles actually kills more girls than boys. And, and, and therefore, the vaccine that we provide to protect children against measles actually is highly pro-gender uh, because it gives disproportionately higher uh, coverage to, to, to girls. Thank you. Thank you, Anurata, for that. You know, you really captured that universal health coverage at the heart is about equity, quality, and financial protection. But taking a, a and applying a gender lens, you know, to uh, immunization really captures the multiple layers and why understanding the deter gender determinants of health is so critical, and particularly um, how it applies to from access um, as well as um, the health disparities that we that you've just highlighted. Uh, I have an immediate follow-up question before before we move on to Alberta but you know particularly how how do how do you see the interaction between Gavi Gavi's work you know really focusing on the on the target population and uh, applying a gender lens addressing the gender determinants of health how is that linked to particularly the health workforce and community health workers so that's a very good question Rupa I uh, we we actually when uh, we look at gender we are act looking at three different levels one is the girl child, so making sure that girl child uh, has the same advantage and same opportunities uh, of, of immunization as, as, as boys, right? That's the first uh, and fundamental level. The second really is adolescent girls, which is about vaccines, which are focused on adolescent girls and then making sure we create expanded or amplified opportunities for, for investing in, in, in adolescents' health and well-being more generally. The third really is... Uh, uh, women, right? And and when I'm talking about women, we are bringing three dimensions to this group of women. One is uh, the mothers themselves, you know, and I talked about gender-related barriers and how mothers can be facilitated or impeded, right? And and really the second is the workforce. And we understand that that uh, there is increased feminization of work uh, health force, including uh, frontline health workers, community health workers, and, and we, we have invested a lot in them because we also find that in some settings where they, that isn't the case and uh, vaccinators are really primarily males, that can be a barrier. And I would cite two countries as examples, 
Pakistan and Afghanistan. In Pakistan, all men uh, vaccinators and, and similarly in Afghanistan, all vaccinators were males. And we found that that itself could be a huge barrier. So therefore, Gavi has partnered with these countries to make sure that we invest in building a very strong lady health workforce so that women, you know, are not impeded. They are encouraged to access uh, immunization, but but also, you know, uh, access other services with, with immunization, because as you know, the immunization often becomes a platform for more integrated RMNCH uh, uh, services. And one uh, other dimension that we are looking at is not just um, regarding uh, women as or girls as beneficiaries of programs or as recipients of, of programs, but as as very proactive uh, change agents. And that's where we have started to forge new and very exciting partnerships with women groups and trying to uh, harness the potential and promise uh, that, that, that they bring. And a, a very recent partnership is with SEVA, the Self-Employed Women Association in India, which has 1.9 million uh, workers who are informal workers but are unionized, the poorest and the most downtrodden, but, uh, but um, you know, high Highly confident, empowered, and now they are becoming aspirational, you know, to give a better future to their next generation. And how do we exploit that is really emerging as a big focus for us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha, for really sharing that and talking about the change agent potential, but um, also how Gavi is tapping into the potential of the health workforce. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to turn to Alberta Freeman. Uh, she's a community health service supervisor, and she's part of the Ministry of Health of Liberia. She has graduated from nursing school with high honors. Um, currently, uh, she's part of Liberia's National Community Health Program. In this role, she works across 23 communities and two facilities to provide supervision and mentorship also to 11 community health workers. Um, Alberta, you know, really looking forward to hearing from you. How are you working to deliver universal health coverage for women and adolescents? Thank you. Good morning to all. As a nurse supervisor on our Liberia National Community Health Worker Program, we are part of a team that is delivering healthcare services to the most remote and vulnerable women and adolescents within the country. We train community health workers in reproductive and maternal health. I coach and mentor community health workers to monitor pregnant women and refer them for AMC VC at the health facility. We also provide health education on the usage of family planning. In our community, most of the people did not have idea on family planning usage at the time that the program was not introduced. But since the introduction of the program, we have seen increase in family planning use. And it's not easier to gain trust, community trust in health worker and demand for family planning. One of the Women we met in the community come in and she already had four children in her eldest 20. At the time that she never had, she have not heard about family planning. But since she heard about the availability of family planning in the community through the community health worker, took a bold step to get on family planning and now she's living a happy life. In the community, we supply community health workers with condom and contraceptive pills. Those who want other options like injection and implant, community health workers are trained to refer them at the health facility where the nurse supervisor at the facility, facility level provides this option for them. Again, I was happy earlier this year to hear from a male community health worker that first time in the history of his community, a female came icing for condom. <laughs> So he was like saying, am I allowed to give condom to a female? I said, yes. <laughs> That's a great change because it's not an easy thing for a female to come to a male health worker to request for condom. But through our health education that we are providing, at least changes taking place out there. And through our effort to provide health education on the uses of family planning, we are trying to reach the last 20% within a country, in a rural area, with universal health coverage. Now we are trying to recruit more females 
because few male are best positioned to discuss health issues within the community. In most of the community we serve, female are not ready free to go out to, to male counterparts, that means the male community health workers to explain their condition to them. But you recruiting more female within a health setting in a community will be able to meet up with our universal health coverage out there. We also train community health workers to provide education on the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases to women and adolescents in the community. And I can assure you that our health education is growing across. We conduct a Monday meeting within the various community to get a feedback from the community members about the work that the community health workers are doing. And within this community meeting, there are good responses that are coming back to us that the community health workers are already trying their best. And now we see demand in the use of condom. Most people out there are requesting for condom. They are requesting for contraceptive pill. They are also requesting for community health workers to start giving them implant, let me say injection, which is depot at the community level. But in our country, the Ministry of Health is still working on that. Maybe in time to come, our community health worker will start providing injection for women in the community, and that would be a great thing for us. I can assure you that we we'll meet up with our universal health coverage. Alberta, I think you really captured it when you said uh, that really, you know, gender equality we say is everybody's business, but making sure that everyone understands that condoms are also for everybody. That just really highlights this point that when we think about, um, you know, women and adolescents and girls, um, we really do need to apply this uh, gender lens and think about how are we engaging with men and how are men also participating in this. I think the other, you know, really powerful, um, you know, way that you demonstrated just that concrete way of why it matters so much to have family planning, having comprehensive sexual medical education, having these components as key, key aspects of what community health workers are providing is these are the needs of people in their communities and if we don't educate them, they're not going to be able to access um, those resources. Mm -hmm. um, so on that note, I'd actually like to turn to the perspective of um, a, a member state Ministry of Health. Um, Tem uh, Temeskin um, Ayu is currently the Director of Primary Health Care, uh, part of the Federal Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. He's passionate about designing policies and programs for universal coverage and ensuring no one is left behind. Um, in addition to uh, being responsible for leading national primary health care in, in Ethiopia, including an innovative community health program, the Health Extension Program, he also is a member of a core team that has developed the National School Health Program framework that has guided school health and nutrition in Ethiopia. Um, Tomaskin, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. How are you working to deliver universal health coverage for women and adolescents? Thank you, Rupa, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, when you talk about universal health coverage, I think the first thing that we need to make sure is what type of services are we going to provide universally for everyone. So in Ethiopia, the first thing that we did is we defined the essential health service package of the country based on the burden of this, the demography of the country, the epidemiological context, and based on the economic status of the country. So in that uh, essential health service package, we defined what type of services need to be provided at the community level, at the health center, hospitals, and also tertiary care. And also we have uh, identified also the financing mechanism for the provision of the essential health service package. And we have put the three types of financing mechanisms. So the first one is some of the services need to be provided freely, free of charge. And some of the services need to be provided on cost sharing, and the, other, the rest should be provided on cost recovery. And when we see the majority of reproductive, maternal, and child health services, they are provided freely from the community, health center, and also hospital level. So in that health service package, uh, uh, to provide uh, the majority of services at the community level, we have designed the, the health extension program. So these health extension workers, they provide a comprehensive, pr uh, promotive, 
preventive and curative services focusing on maternal and child health, major communicable diseases, and also hygiene and sanitation and the provision of health, edu health education. And all of the services provided at the health post level are provided freely. And uh, some of the services beyond the capacity of the health extension workers will be referred to the health centers and above. And uh, one of the components of universal health coverage is also financing. So to ensure that uh, the Ethiopian uh, population is risk protected, we have started uh, a community-based health insurance scheme, especially targeting the rural parts of the Ethiopia. And uh, currently around uh, nearly 500 districts or around 20 million Ethiopians are protected and covered through this community-based health insurance scheme. And when we see how especially adolescents and women are uh, targeted in this universal health coverage scheme, for example, if we see uh, the adolescents, and according to the Ethiopian context, when we see where, are the, where the adolescents spend much of the time, they spend much of their time in schools and universities. That's why we need to uh, design, redesign our health service provision, targeting schools and also universities. So one of the service delivery points of the health extension workers is the schools. But also we have developed a national school health and nutrition uh, program so that to deliver basic package of health services uh, uh, for adolescents and uh, especially use in schools and also in universities. In addition to that, we are also working with uh, partners like Pathfinder in scaling up uh, use-friendly adolescent and use-friendly use services in public health centers so that to address the needs of adolescents in public hospitals. So these are some of the initiatives that we are working in uh, addressing also adolescents and women in the provision of universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for really pro providing that. And I think the really powerful message there, again, about uh, tapping in to the community health workforce, um, and especially using this extension approach, health extension um, work, workers, to really reach the communities that are hard to reach and leave no one behind. Um, on that note, I'd like to actually turn to Annie Toro. Uh, she's currently the president and executive director of the What to Expect Project. Annie has worked uh, in the field of policy for almost 25 years. Um, she has held senior management level positions at various widely recognized uh, entities working in multilaterals with NGOs. Um, and I could go on and on, but Annie, really, you know, you've had very, um, you know, deep breath uh, understanding of global health and, uh, and really the landscape and would like to turn to you to ask you the same question. You know, what are you currently doing um, and how are you working to deliver universal health coverage for women and adolescents? And I can't help it, but with a title like your organization, What to Expect Project, what can we expect? I know, right? Um, I actually get that question a lot. <laughs> was an original. <laughs> no, it was original actually. It, nobody has uh, asked me that since I got here. And that was uh, so. Thank you, Rupa. It's a pleasure to see you all, always, and and uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate our panel. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, and and thank you to all the co-sponsors um, and co-hosts of the event. I also wanted to thank the uh, the communities at the heart of UHC campaign. Uh, which is um, advocating currently um, for having a strong voice in preparation for the U UHC high-level um, uh, meeting, planning and all that it takes uh, to make that possible, and they've been working that nonstop. So um, as you can imagine from, um, from, from what to expect, um, which um, was born, I guess, I would have to say pun intended, right? Um, uh, in, in saying what to expect when you're expecting, out of um, out of an inspiration um, of, of of the world's most read and best known book series on on pregnancy in the world, and um, and it's which is now been you know translated into more than forty languages. Um, I cannot keep up with uh, um, uh, copies and and all the, the those different things, but I'm sure you all do. Uh, or have heard about it. Um, but 
we um we believe that all expecting moms um need to receive a culturally and linguistically appropriate and community specific support to be able to have a healthy pregnancy um and a safe delivery um we um we we are very um focused on partnerships and and through trained peer to peer support we work to help them help other moms in their communities and um through partnerships you know what we do is that we have this whole mom whole family whole community approach um that supports the most vulnerable moms before during and after pregnancy and beyond which is which is really unique and it's really the model um of when um um Heidi actually uh, and, and the board uh, appointed me to this um, uh, position um, as president um, in, in looking at um, this gap of, 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 of how we're looking at things and, and sometimes we're, we're not looking at, at the continuum of services and what that entails and looking at the, the model of, okay, what if we're able to look at issues of preconception and then pregnancy and then you know what happens after pregnancy and then what happens beyond that um, we're able to not only be able to be a, 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 an incredible resource for women and be able to be there for them um, but we're sort of the hand holding person to be able to do that um, during um, one of the most challenging and important times in a woman's life if she so chooses. Um, so while well, it's ambitious about our goal of seeing communities delivering universal health coverage for women and adolescents, we, um, we actually base our day-to-day -day work on activities and plans that, that are realistic that and, and and that might be the the advocate in me and 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 or maybe the lawyer in me i don't know um and 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 that it's comprehensive but it's also adaptable to the needs of all communities that it's not one size fits all um and we take this um an all hands on deck approach when when we look at this um and we focus on partnerships and involving various agencies, professionals, diverse sectors, um, and other stakeholders, and being very mindful of um, including uh, those very non-traditional um, engage uh, actors engage in in these issues, um, dialogues, and operations. I sometimes I find myself, you know, I guess over in all these years. Um, having a lot of conversations and we have people um, in our room or in our platforms who are mind lagged people and 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 I'm, we're always thinking of how can we bring those folks who typically wouldn't be um, at the table who would take a little bit of mm, to be able to sit with us and and I find that we have so much more in common with people than we have um, things that separate us and, and and if we can stick to that that's that's an important point and uh, Annie I think you're touching on upon really like uh, you know this um, challenge of uh, you know the barriers and how do you actually really engage because we know that um, delivering universal health coverage for women and adolescents and putting them at the center is is a challenge right mm -hmm. um, and I want to uh, challenge you to kind of provide us a concrete example of how you're doing it. I mean, you've talked about the principles, about partnerships, and yeah. really engaging everybody and being deliberate about that and not it being an afterthought. Can you share one Absolutely. example uh, from your work? Absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll mention, I mean, uh, you the, there are one-pagers um, when you go out, so you can see the 10 pillars that we created um, to be the, the main focus of our areas of work. Um, which really cut across what I mentioned, preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, and beyond. Um, I, I wanted to mention that uh, before I go into this specific issue, um, which is a, an excellent question, Rupa, as always, um, that we also, because we work in the U.S. and globally, we have a tremendous relationship with the USO, the United, um, United Service Organizations, as you know, it's, it's, it supports military service members, military families, and what we do with them is to hold, host baby showers for, for military moms to be um, 
and we do this globally and also in the U.S. And, and I mean, I could go and talk about that forever because the needs in, in those populations and the opportunity to be able to have um, when you're isolated and not have someone to talk to can be um, incredibly, uh, I, I won't say twofold, threefold. I mean, it can be incrementally uh, significant. Um, but that's something that we've been doing for, for many years. And, uh, and we also, for us, it's key to our work uh, to ensure that we don't forget any moms, that, um, that we really are comprehensive in the way that we look at these issues. That's why we're involved, obviously, in so many um, advocacy efforts that drive our work, um, at, at both domestically and the U.S. And, for instance, we're very involved in, in issues impacting pregnant women in prisons, which is something that people don't really talk about. Um, and I could go on if you get me started on that, uh, which is an issue that I wasn't even, having worked in this field for all these different issues and, 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 and on this specific for, you know, obviously more than, than 20, almost 25 years, um, it's been incredible to me to see how women are treated in prisons as an example. And so we're, we're working with legislators to, to be able to, and, and also a lot of, um, of, of, of community-based organizations in different places mm -hmm. that are trying to address these problems um, to make sure that women have, uh, you know, restoring some dignity and, and some decency at a time that is so sensitive in women's life, regardless of whether they are. It doesn't matter that they're in prison, but, you know, if they're pregnant, I mean, they shouldn't be in shackles when they're having their, their, their prenatal visit or when they're giving birth. I mean, as an example, uh, which is mind blowing. Um, but so that was before your question, but just, uh, you know, one thing that we're specifically tackling at Rupa is the issue of stigma. Um, that's a huge priority for us. Um, you know, the, the, the term UHC scares uh, a lot of people. Um, I guess it depends on where we are, in what country we are. Um, but UHC sometimes can be seen as it's, it's going outside of, of that individualistic view of life uh, to one that is more community-based focus. And, um, and so what it's sort of like what it's good for my neighbor, it's also good for me. I don't need to know or, or you know, your race, ethnicity, religion, political affiliation, among all the factors to, to care for you, to have access to much-needed equality. Uh, much needed quality services without the risk of financial harm. Um, so for us, it's been targeting and bringing in the issue of stigma everywhere we go so that women are not stigmatized, so the issues are not stigmatized, and we bring it in every single pillar of our 10 issue priority areas. Sorry, that was probably longer than what you were yeah. expecting. Uh, Any fantastic point there about like how exactly do you you know make women and uh, really the center of everything is making it cross cutting mm -hmm. and not having it as an afterthought. I think that's that's great that your principles do that uh, and that you have found a tangible way of really um, targeting it on stigmatization. Um, and so I think that's that's a great example. I actually want to. Uh, you know, jump back to Temeskin, um, you know, really uh, in a country that is championing for universal health coverage does not need any convincing, um, really doing uh, important work um, in, in communities and, and using health workers and community health workers um, to the maximum. What, what challenges, what barriers are you facing? And at the same time, uh, anytime I ask a question about barriers, I always challenge the people. So what opportunities are you also seeing? <clears throat> Thank you. Maybe to start on the opportunities, over the last 20 years we have invested a lot, especially in improving the infrastructure of health facilities in building health centers, health posts, and in training of uh, nearly 40,000 community health workers, and also in uh, also improving the primary health care, special health centers, who are providing the necessary mentorship and supervision for the community health workers. So. The opportunity is relatively we have a large number of health workforce and also a better infrastructure comparing uh, before years. But one of the challenges that uh, we are facing is currently, especially on the financing aspect, if we really need to achieve UHC, 
with the current financing mechanism, it would be a challenge for a country uh, as well. So, for example, if you see the uh, healthcare financing and the payment mechanism in Ethiopia, nearly 30% of the payment is out-of-pocket payment. So when we see universal health coverage, we need to reduce this out-of-pocket mm -hmm. payment, and there must be uh, um, more investment from the government, but also from bilateral organizations. And the other challenge is regarding especially the community health workers. Uh, we need to more on mo motivating and also uh, retaining the community health workers. Mm. So and on that, on that point, you really touched on something. What, what are ways that um, community health workers can have decent work that you're seeing and that Ethiopia is doing? Sorry? Um, what are the ways um, that you said retention is a challenge with community yeah. health workers? How, and how, how are you trying to solve that right now? Yeah, to solve, especially on the motivation and retention of health extension, the community health workers program as a whole, the first thing is it should be integrated to the system the overall health system of the country. So in Ethiopia, the community health program is integrated into the overall health system. And the other thing is we need to pay the community health workers so that we should to retain the community health workers. The other most important thing, we need to have a clear uh, career development for the health extension, like for the community health workers program. Previously in Ethiopia, most of the health extension workers were raising complaints, especially on their career development. So, so, so great points there. You need to value the community health workers, yes. invest in them, compensate them, yeah. and uh, and that's how you really work on reten re retention as well. That's great points. And I'd actually like to turn to the community workers on our panel. Um, you know, we've heard a wide range of perspectives here already. Um, you know, beginning with you, Rita. Um, you know, w what what do you think are are the barriers? And uh, and you know, you talked about how digital. Um, tools are helping you address some of the barriers in your work, um, but what's probably the one main barrier that you're facing in being able to uh, deliver universal coverage for women and adolescents and any opportunities that you, that you see to address that? Okay, thank you, Rupa. Okay, the most important barriers which we have, which we have in our communities, the most one is being part of the high, not being part of the high level community conversations, we have that barrier. If community workers are brought up in the meetings like these ones, and at least we pass out our voices as community health workers, I think this would help us to improve. We, will, we also have a barrier of our voices being heard. Eh? We need the voice of the community health work to be heard. Hmm? The audience who, which is here, it's really my appeal that at least let our voices as community health workers be heard. Hmm? We also have a problem of, okay, I want to appreciate Living Goods and the Ministry of Health because it has, it has given me this opportunity to come and pass out the voice of the community health workers. I have represented 3,300 community workers in my country. And there are some neighboring countries wow. which are also represented as a community health worker. I think that I've deserves an applause, yes. Yeah, community workers need to be brought on the table so that we pass out our voices because we are the, we are the ones who, who are what? At the grassroots. Exactly. We are the ones implementing the real work. So mm -hmm. we need to be brought on the table. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rita, your call for making sure that community health workers are at the table has been heard, and everybody in this room really should make sure that 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 that, that those perspectives are part of their agenda moving forward. So thank thank you for being very specific about the barrier and the solution. I'd like to turn to Alberta. Alberta, you know you've. Um, shared a bit about uh, really the power of uh, educating in the communities and, and empowering community health workers. Um, you know, what, what's the main barrier that you're seeing in providing universal health coverage for women and adolescents? And, uh, and what would be your call? What solution or opportunity do you see? Thank you. One main barrier in our country is traditional practices and belief. In such of practice, one example of this practice is home-based delivery. In the history of Liberia, three traditional midwives 
have made their income from delivering babies in the community, which has been passed on from generation to generation. But since the introduction of this program, community health workers were trained to make birth plan for pregnant women and encourage pregnant women to give birth at the health facility. For this reason, TTM's fee threatened. The fees that we are taking their job from them, what they make their income from, we are trying to take it from them. For this reason, they try to spread misbelief about giving birth at the facility and they are encouraging pregnant women to deliver within the community. So I think if the people in this room can find means to motivate train traditional midwives within the community, mm -hmm. we we'll meet up with our universal health coverage. Because some of my community, we still have serious problem with home delivery. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of Health in Liberia <coughs> gave us, issued us letter to take within the various community to tell the trained traditional midwife to stop delivering women at the community. But <laughs> I don't think that will put stop to it. The only, the only thing I will put into home delivery will be motivating the TTMs at least by finding like incentive for them. If you refer like two, three pregnant women at the facility, this is what we give you, this will be your benefit. I think that will help for us in our country. Thank, thank you, Alberta, for really, you know, talking about the importance of, uh, you know, engaging with community-based people and, uh, and health workers, but also just community-based um, members and you know the t taking on these challenges and there therefore these uh, you know, myths and notions that uh, uh, they don't respect borders we see them happening um, in lower middle income countries as much as high income countries as well so I think it's a very very important that applies to everybody when we talk about universal coverage we really always need to keep the universal lens on it um, so on that note I'd like to you know turn back to Anuruddha and you know I'm, I'm going to give you a big big challenge because you're you know part of the multi multilateral um, level of working and as as you've been able to see the large landscape um, and come from an in-country background as well uh, what what are the barriers um, that we're that you're noticing and that we as a community in global health are facing and being able to deliver UHC for women and adolescents and and as um, we challenge you to think about the barriers where where are the opportunities how can the advocates in this room and partners really be supporters of this agenda too uh, so two uh, thoughts here one that uh, I think at the country level there can be often a disconnect between communities and, and the health system, you know, because that interface uh, is missing. And community health workers, wherever, wherever they, uh, they have been developed and nurtured, can provide that, that interface. And I'm, I'm saying this on the strength of my experience in India, where we actually developed a community health workforce of one million. So we had one million uh, ASHAs, the accredited social health activists, and I personally saw the kind of change they, they brought about because they really became the connectors or the integrators between what the community wanted or needed and, 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 the, and, the, and the health system. Because a lot of times, you know, if, if we sort of talk about financing, financing can be ill-targeted. You know, you can have uh, facilities constructed in places, you know, where, where uh, communities don't need them or communities don't reside in the vicinity of those, uh, those uh, facilities. Even where facilities exist, the brick and mortar, you could still have a shortage of uh, service providers. And therefore, they are really ghost uh, buildings. Even where you have a health workforce, they could actually be moonlighting because accountability systems are missing. And I think what this uh, community health workforce did for us in India was to actually align sort of expectations of the community with the responses of the health system. And as we saw stronger uh, health-seeking behavior from, from, from communities, it generated a lot of pressure on the health system to actually deliver. So I remember that when our institutional birth rates in India shot up, 
also partly because we had a huge conditional cash transfer scheme and then we had this community health work uh, force mm -hmm. uh, uh, motivating uh, women to come and deliver uh, in public health institutions we saw uh, the institutional birth rate moving from 47% actually to 87% mm -hmm. in in a period of about uh, 3 years and and that brought uh, immense strain on our health facilities because our health facilities were simply not equipped to handle that case load and we had uh, we had a situation where actually women were lying on the floor because there were simply not enough beds or or and i think that is what challenged the health system and the next step for us was to actually make sure that i our financing was targeted towards augmentation of those health facilities which were actually witnessing a uh, huge uh, case load so so to me that is so far as the global uh, community is concerned i i personally feel again there is a, there is a disconnect you know between global discourse and and really the ground level uh, action uh, i i personally feel that uh, thinking at the global level moves very slowly and action moves even more slowly so so what happens is that at the global level there is a lot of rhetoric but if it is not backed by concrete tangible actions then then clearly it's a lot of talk but walking the talk is 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 indeed uh, a challenge so i really think at the global level we have to constantly challenge ourselves mm -hmm. to to go beyond just words and rhetoric uh, towards uh, sort of advocating innovative solutions and then not just rest easy with pilots or projects so you know a lot of times uh, we we run pilots and projects which are not sustainable which are not scaled up and they are often presented as best practices at at global conferences but i think really the challenge here is how do you uh, how do you establish a proof of concept and then quickly uh, uh, work with the national governments to take them to scale and then replicate them across uh, countries thank thank you anuruddha and uh, I, you've really set up a uh, a nice uh, platform to really turn to the room. We've heard a broad range of perspectives here. We're still going to hear more from our panelists, but being mindful um, that I'm sure you have a lot of questions for them. We have uh, voices from the community. We have ministries. We have multilateral perspective, NGO perspective. So really, uh, please welcoming your questions. What we'll do is um, we'll take one at a time um, and, uh, and then you know see where we go. If you could please say your name and your organization and um, keep the questions brief, please. No more than two sentences. I can also move as well. Hello, I'm Michaela Newman, Advocacy Manager with the Union for International Cancer Control. And uh, I will try to be brief, but um, we opened first with a, a call to action to focus on women in the UN high-level meeting conversations in September. Uh, and we also covered a couple of other areas where advocacy would be very critical, addressing stigma, uh, a voice for community health workers at the table even for um, improved coverage of HPV vaccination to eliminate cervical cancer, we would need to generate demand. Uh, so I'm wondering from each of you how we need to position advocacy and an investment in advocacy alongside an investment in service delivery because I've now heard three times during the WHA that funding is actually decreasing in terms of uh, supporting civil society in advocating for improved health uh, coverage. Thank you. I, I love to. I have so many things that I want to say and, and even reach uh, uh, answer something related to the UHC high-level meeting question about real universal, uh, universality, but maybe I can address that a little later so that I can go straight to your point. Um, I cannot thank you enough for that question. It's been one of the, um, the core principles that we've been working on and prioritize, so it's just uh, music to my ears, which usually when I'm that jet lagged, I, music is the last thing that I hear. 
Um, so uh, I, I thank you for your question. Um, so in terms of, you know, some of the issues that keep women, especially, uh, you know, I'll focus on moms given, you know, the work that I do, um, from seeking help, which is a huge, huge problem. Um, feeling judged. We hear this over and over again. Feeling talked to, not with. Talked down to. Not feeling worthy of asking questions, not knowing what questions to ask, not knowing their bodies, not feeling ownership of their bodies, being victims of violence. About one in three women worldwide have experienced either physical or sexual intimate partner violence or non-intimate um, partner violence in their lifetime. Not having the kind of information in the right tone, the right language, which is accessible, it's not accessible, Relatable, empathetic, and empowering to women. Confronting stigma, going back to that point again. For moms, you know, this is, there's even more stigma. It's the whole pregnancy is supposed to be a happy time. Becoming a mom is supposed to be a happy time. Being a mom is supposed to be selfless. So caring about your own feelings goes against a global cultural norm that we've created. Um, motherhood is something a woman's body is supposed to handle with ease or loving and connecting with their baby. It's supposed to come naturally. Um, so when do that doesn't happen, just women just tend to kind of get into my themselves. They don't talk about it. They are filled with shame. They don't, they don't express themselves. And then that has huge repercussions on their health and mental health. Um, the guilt issue is pervasive if a woman doesn't feel excited about pregnancy or her new baby. And then due to that, um, you know, women are too often hesitant to bring it up with their healthcare provider. And, uh, or they simply write it off as the baby blues or mood swings resulting from hormonal changes, which I have to say personally, it just gets on my nerves. Um, you know, I, I, maybe as a mother of a toddler, uh, just, it's, it's just something so unfair. Um, and the importance of mental health within this context needs to be really highlighted. And I, I have to mention this point because it's just too important. Most cases of postpartum depression happen after six weeks and we all know um, that many women do not attend that six week postpartum appointment if they ever are in a country or in a position to be able to do that. Nobody should be suffering in silence out of fear of stigma or shame, which would then lead to not being able to be diagnosed and which when needed, refer to properly trained mental health professionals. And then lastly, the treatment strategies involving an uh, issues like antidepressants, or they're often written off as a non-starter or unsafe before a physician has a chance to properly weigh in the risk. Um, you know, from in, in, in terms of changing this, from issues of stop shaming and judging, um, you know, my, our founder's favorite um, a mantra is motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood. No matter where you're in the world, no matter what the mom says, socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, religious, racial, cultural, etc., um, every mom shares a bond. Every mom wants the healthiest start for her baby's life. And every mom deserves a healthy pregnancy, a safe delivery, and a healthy baby. You have to, and we have to think avoiding stereotypes. And sometimes we do that among ourselves in workplaces and, and among friends. You know, this, 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 this avoiding stereotypes and, and not supporting one another with their own differences. Being a mom isn't easy under the best of circumstances, I have to say. And certainly being pregnant isn't easy. And I think of all of us who have done it before uh, can agree giving birth isn't um, easy, but take away the conveniences and I can go in the knowledge, the medical care, the cushy birthing, et cetera, et cetera. And what does that leave you? And I can go into the non-air conditioning and all these things that we see firsthand in developing countries. Um, and this, so, uh, yeah, okay. this, this doesn't even cover it. <laughs> and, and, the, and my last point was on advocacy because I can, I can never, you know, um, but in terms of that specific question, it's, it's on advocacy because you really need to speak up. And when you don't do that, then nothing, it's ever, it's ever changed. So... Sorry, Rupa. You no, just, no, you, no, get, you got you're, you're it. It was an. It, it, blame it on her. It was a. It, it, it was a powerful question. <laughs> and, 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 you, and and you're completely right. I think that deserves a hand of applause. Oh. Thank you.
Thank you. So, so getting your getting your points on the platform and being a strong advocate for these issues and really um, sharing the personal journey. You know, I, need, I think Annie, your your points really highlight that if we don't start talking as people to policymakers, we're not going to get the financing. We're not going to be able to change the dialogue, and and that's why that was a very important message. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, the audience, you can actually push the button um, on the mics. Um, so uh, next question, please. Anybody have a, yes. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. I'm a medical student from Nepal and I'm with the IFMSA delegation. And my question is to uh, please either... Please say your name as well. Oh, my name is Angela, sorry. And uh, my question is either to Rita or Alberta. So in Nepal, we also have a very strong community of female community health volunteers, and they are the backbone of our health system. And what we've been seeing for the past 10 years is our contraceptive prevalence rate has been constant at about 49%. So do you have any specific solutions as to how you promote uh, contraceptive usage in your community that we can learn from and maybe implement in ours? Thank you. Uh, Alberta, would you like to begin? Yeah. Thank you. In our community, where we work, the people had the belief that contraceptive was like stopping them from having children. If they take contraceptive, they will come down with cancer, it will make their, their adult mental esteem. We are trying to put stop to them from having their babies. But we go out here informing them about the importance of contraceptive, telling them that all oh, this is just a myth. You can use contraceptive for even two, three, four, five years. At the end of the day, anytime you want to have your baby, you are going to have your baby. So through this health education and through the community health worker, who live within the community, who speak the dialect of the people, and telling them, showing them the job A that we provide. Mm -hmm. After you see contraceptive, this person, after you see contraceptive, <laughs> after two, three months, you are, the person got pregnant and born and gave birth to a healthy baby, and telling them that using contraceptive to space between your children will make you to have a healthy children. That's the reason, let me say, that's true, that means that we are getting they trust, the community trust within the health worker and they are continuing to take in contraceptive more and more. I hope I answer your question the right way. So, so really uh, basing it on trust. Uh, Rita, would you like to also respond to that mm. one? And more that, in our communities, I told you we go down door to door. So we have this teaching aid whereby there are pictures. So when you show the community the pictures, they learn more. There is a heading here, when is getting pregnant extra dangerous? So you, sh you show them, the first picture shows when you are still young, when you are too old, when you have many children, and then too close. So you explain picture to picture, the communities get to understand, all right? Yes, <laughs> they understand. The problems, they lack knowledge. Hmm? We need to go down and teach these communities what to do. Some don't know what to do, others they know, some little. So we need just to go down. So that's why I still appeal. Door to door, Support picture to picture. For that we make. Th th thank you, Rita. Do we have any more questions? And I saw some hands on this side of the room. So woman in the very back there. If do you, have, you, you can press the mic at your table. Um, do we have a... Okay, I can. Please, if you can state your name and organization, too. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Paula Quigley. I'm, I'm with DAI Global Health. Um, and I've been working in Zambia for a long time, particularly on demand side, um, increasing access to maternal and newborn health services. And we have seriously struggled over the years to convince the government to put in a national program 
that builds on the really good results that we've had on a, on a pretty small scale, but on, a, on a, also on a pretty low budget. So I'm very um, always um, inspired by countries like Ethiopia, where I live part time, and the health extension program, and hearing about um, um, Liberia as well, which have really taken things to the national level. But it's ser very, very difficult to get governments to find a budget that um, pays for things like community empowerment and women's empowerment. And we have just struggled. So um, I know, you know you've done it really well in Ethiopia, but you have a particular context there where you've got huge political commitment to a, communi a community program right down in, even into family level. So you know, how can we really help other countries to get to that stage and promote that financing? All right, thanks, thanks, Paula. So um, I'm going to actually ask uh, Tomeskin to answer that question of like, uh, how do you get the political will to really fund um, community engagement? And Anruta, um, being at the global platform and I'm coming from a country perspective, I'd like to pose that to you next. Okay, thank you. So to see how we how we do get the political commitment, I think we need to see also the historical background of the health extension program. So in Ethiopia, we used to have a 20 years health sector development program, which was divided in five years. And the first one uh, was implemented from 1990 to 2003. So in that uh, health sector development program, after five years of evaluation, the findings were mostly the basic package of health services were not provided at the household <laughs> level. And the major cause of uh, morbidity and mortality were easily preventable diseases. So that uh, findings show that if we implement a community-based uh, health program and provide basic package of health services with the community health workers, we can prevent majority of morbidity and mortality. And so the evidence was the major factor to bring the so community health program at the political level. So using evidence yes. was a key component to build political will. Yes. Okay. And then later, since the health extension program was a political agenda, and the implementation was led by the political, uh, political st starting from the prime minister to uh, district, uh, ma district administrators. The implementation was successful, especially in the uh, startup of the program. And then after the implementation, seeing the results <coughs> of the health extension program in terms of scaling up uh, the contraceptive acceptance rate, and especially in reducing the child mortality, the government is more committed to invest. So leadership at all levels, and then demonstrating uh, the fact that it actually works really propelled yeah. it. And uh, maybe also to answer one of our questions, how can other countries learn? Uh, recently, we have established also International Institute for Primary Health Care to improve the South-to-South -South learning on the experience of Ethiopia. So that institute collaborates with other countries to uh, document what the health extension program Ethiopia did, and also to share the Ethiopian experience to other uh, developing countries. Great, that's, that's a concrete example. Anruda? So uh, let me uh, try and uh, sort of touch on what I see as, as a historical problem. And, and I do think that uh, normative agencies such as WHO have traditionally not uh, emphasized enough the importance of allied health workforce and community health workers. I think uh, the whole model you know, that, that was promoted, uh, was arrested or hinged on, on the availability of doctors. And I think the, uh, uh, in countries, really, the key message was that it is doctors who would deliver uh, primary health care. And I think our experience on the ground has now shown that that indeed was a fallacious uh, thought. And if, if we are serious about equity, then first of all, you won't have uh, uh, doctors in sufficient quantities if you really want them to go to the front lines. And even where you have doctors, the motivation to go and serve in remote rural areas is going to be extremely low. And we have seen that across countries. So clearly, and also the whole concept of task shifting. You know, what is it that you can you can shift to, to allied health workforce and community health workers? So I think that paradigm needs to change. And while we see some very interesting uh, uh, successes, you know, uh, on community health workforce front uh, in some countries, uh, I, I do think it has hasn't been embraced as, as a global uh, agenda uh, or call to action by normative agencies, you know, like, like WHO. And I think that needs to happen 
sooner uh, rather than uh, later. And, and Gavi's uh, nudging uh, away? You no, know, and yes, we are. We are because, for example, we are actually proactively advocating for strengthening frontline health workforce and community health workforce. For example, we now have uh, developed this very interesting partnership with the Last Mile Health and Living Goods and for three countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Li Liberia. But we also know, as somebody said, it requires long-term commitment by, by the political executive because it is highly resource intensive. Otherwise, your intervention would, would stay very, very small. And how you can build political will around some of these uh, initiatives. And I'm now going to come back to that question on advocacy. I think when we advocate for, for disruption or for innovative approaches, that has to be backed by evidence. So, so I do think it is time for us at the global level to actually create that knowledge or collate that knowledge and systematically share it with countries. Because if countries see high rate of return uh, on, uh, on the potential investments, you can actually influence them to redirect uh, their, 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 their investments and, and their, their financing. Uh, because you know everybody is going to going to strive uh, for for equity and universal health coverage. But if we are not stitched up here at the global level, I think we are going to end up bamboozling uh, countries a lot. Thank you, thank you, Anwada. So we're coming to the the close of the panel, which is tough because there's still so much more to be said. Uh, we know that the high level meeting uh, for universal health coverage is approaching. It's a uh, right after summer. So a lot of important work needs to be done. Um, we have the universal health coverage UHC 2030 asks, which are which are strong. Um, uh, they're specific. There's milestones. Um, the global health community is rallying behind that. Um, there is a alliance that is called Alliance for uh, Gender Equality and UHC that Lois um, talked about. You can learn more information about that. There are a few members in the room, um, including myself, and uh, there's some flyers on the seventh ask, um, really focusing on women's rights and gender equality. So those are some ways to engage in concrete ways, join the alliance. Um, support and endorse the ask, or also just continue to put the UHC 2030 ask. But I'd like to actually turn to the panelists here and uh, ask them to, in two sentences, oh, gosh. <laughs> we have to be uh, concise to close on time, uh, but really also just so that everyone really hears your strongest takeaway message here. What would you like to see at the high level meeting um, happening in September and beyond. Uh, and I'm actually gonna begin uh, with Rita. Rita can see that I'm taking, uh, looking at her. We're gonna begin um, with Rita and then just move on from that. Okay, thank you very much, Ropa. Okay, I'm going to be straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see how countries will implement, hmm? how the countries will implement what we have passed out. I also want to see that community health workers are supported. Hmm? They are incentivized, they are motivated at the, so that they can deliver the real work. So we just need support, that's what I would say. And I am looking forward to see countries implementing this act. Thank you very much. Support the community health workers and countries being behind that. Anaruda. So first of all, emphasis on community-based primary health care as the gateway to universal health coverage. I think that is, that is not clear at this point of time at all. And I think somebody needs to stand up and say, uh, our vision of universal health coverage would be achieved or shall be achieved only when we invest sufficiently in community-based primary health care. But that's a stepping stone too. The second is excluded populations first, because I always worry about you know better off sections of population getting more coverage 
age and, and excluded populations not receiving enough attention. So I think our definition of success really has to be the coverage that we are able to extend to missed uh, po populations. The third is a realization that USC would need to be tailored to each country's context because countries are at different trajectories, so their essential health packages are going to look very, very different, and it's going to be a progressive journey which would unfold uh, incrementally. And the last thing is sustainable financing, and I think that roadmap has to be in place because you need deep pockets for USC to happen, and otherwise there's going to be a complete disconnect, and, and I personally fear there could be allocative uh, skewedness because uh, the re scarce resources couldn't end up uh, uh, in tertiary care more than primary health care. Thank you. Uh, Alberta? I will close by saying if everyone in here can think about the needed investment on salary, supply, and safety for female health workers, we can succeed in universal health coverage for women and adolescents. Thank you. Fair and concise. Tad Tomaskin? I, I think uh, I do expect three outputs from specialists a high level meeting. The first one is countries bilateral and multilateral organizations to commit for more investment for health and to consider health as a development agenda as well. And the second one is, I think, uh, donors, partners, and also multilateral and bilateral organizations should prioritize universal health coverage and in provision of comprehensive health care rather than disease specific uh, programs and projects. And the third one is, uh, I think, countries should prioritize primary health care as they pass toward the senior science coverage. Thank you. Annie? All right. Concise, please. <laughs> I'll try. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so the first one, it's, it's, it's reaching real universality. And by that, I mean remembering that all SDGs and all themes under each and beyond um, are connected. All of them have an important impact on women and adolescents from poverty eradication, zero hunger, I can go on. It's not only about gender equality as the one that we, a lot of us focus on, but it, it ranges also to decent work, economic growth, and I can go on and on. Um, what about women and adolescents with disabilities? What about women and adolescents with mental health problems? Um, what about older women? Um, there's a big discrepancy between saying what sounds right and doing what's right. And uh, in the words, you know, I guess as, 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 as an advocacy person, in the words of the late U.S. Senator uh, Paul Wellston, never separate the life you live uh, from the words you speak. Um, there are serious problems in this world, and that includes the approximately 830 deaths um, that of women whose lives are lost daily from preventable complications related to pregnancy and childbirth. And for every woman who dies, 20 or 30 encounter injuries, infections, or disabilities. And number two, uh, we must have a greater focus on prevention. Um, the ultimate in prevention is also the ultimate in cost effectiveness, which is comprehensive reproductive prenatal care for all moms, well child care for every little one, no matter where they live or what they can afford. And this is done through the courageous work of health workers who sacrifice their comfort, their safety, and too often their lives for the well-being of others. They work to save the lives of millions of people day and night, and they need to be well supported, they need to be well trained, they, they need to have um, us to be their advocates. Great. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. Lots of strong asks for the universal health coverage, but key themes are about changing the narrative, seeing women as drivers of health, valuing and investing in community health workers, thinking about digital technologies to improve access, but also really at the heart, root out inequities, leave no one behind, and be practical about it, build partnerships, finance it, make the investment case, and uh, together with collective action, really making sure we get the most out of the high-level meeting and beyond. So thank you, every um, panelist, for really coming here today, putting your asks forward, and um, sharing your lessons learned. Thank you. But we're not done yet. We have, I'd like to invite Dr. Princess Notamba, 
are also known as Nono Simalea. She's the Assistant Director General, Special Advisor on Key Pragmatic Priorities at the World Health Organization. On today's panel, we had several um, requests of what WHO should be doing. We are going to be hearing from her directly on what WHO is doing, what their plans are at the national, regional, and global level to ensure that UHC delivers for women and adolescents. To you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I must just start by confessing that I didn't know that uh, the tooth fairy visits old people like me, but I seem to have <laughs> suffered from a tooth fairy visit. So excuse my, uh, my strange looking uh, face. Um, um, sure. The, di the discussions here were very, very robust. I'm really, really excited to hear the voices of all the people here on the stage, especially uh, the representative of uh, community workers, my colleague from Gavi, and all of the other uh, panelists who made inputs. I think there is a lot of pressure um, at, at different levels for us to do something. I'll speak um, as the question was about how we as WHO uh, are going to take the road forward. I think there is a lot of challenge that we are going to face because UHC, I think, is not new. It's really not new. And the question we should mm -hmm. be asking is, what are the things we got wrong in yes. the beginning? And yeah. my biggest mm -hmm. fear, and um, well, it's a fear that I hope doesn't become a reality, is that there is a UHC rhetoric up here, and there is a different re reality at country level. And what needs to bring those things together, which is the elephant in the room, is to really hold our political leaders accountable. Okay. My biggest, biggest anxiety is all of the big talk that's going to happen in September, and then nothing at country level. So something needs to change about how we hold people who sign declarations to account. Because come another five years, it will be the same story. So I think we need to really organize much more strongly on the ground and insist that one of these days, such high-level meetings be held in developing countries so that people can see the reality. Hold that meeting in a village so that you understand what the people's needs are and not theorize about, oh, we will do all sorts of things. The biggest fear is that countries are going to run off and buy all these expensive machines, build big hospitals, when in fact the need is at the community level. Why are we not building on the strengths of communities? What is it that we can teach women in communities where they have always struggled new things? Why don't we say, what is it that you can do for yourselves and then assist them? Give them a hand up rather than a hand down, because that is something that can help. Build on that strength and extend the reach of services to communities rather than expecting communities to come into your system. And I think that's the point that Anurada was making, is that for me, primary health care should be community systems first and then the primary health care level. There is absolutely no doubt that we will never have enough qualified or well-trained health providers. We won't. We've already predicted that there's going to be a shortage of about 18 million health workers. But what are we doing about it now? We are not investing in the training of even young people to take that space. We, the innovations that come on become too expensive for governments to take. All of these things are things that are being thought about are being discussed. And I think with this new transformation, what we are doing in WHO is now doing a bottom-up planning. But even that bottom-up planning will hit a bottleneck if we are not contextualizing what countries need. So that is the next pressure and step that needs to be taken. And many questions were asked in, in the, in the, in the um, assembly now about what will strengthening the countries look like? Because we spend a lot of time planning up here, but we really need to change the paradigm. So my 
you know, my contributions and my take home message, and I've gathered all of some of the comments here, is that we need to fast track our ability to connect with communities. I think it hasn't been a tradition of WHO at country level. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to even not start afresh. There are institutions there. So let's build on that and make ourselves part of the communities. That's the first thing. Thank you. The second thing I think is to do the global conversations, but really strengthen local planning and execution because it, it can happen that we have the capacity to do both the global thinking and the guidelines and its implementation. There is a big gap. So we now are looking at how you simplify that 120 page guideline into the kind of, uh, uh, of teaching aid that uh, the, the lady has. Simple, on the wall that people can read and understand. Mm -hmm. If somebody can really help us to simplify this medical language, even UHC, if you went to somebody in the village and said, you know, I'm bringing you UHC, it's mm -hmm. like, what? They're like, what? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, NCDs or, you know, the people don't talk like that. And we must insist yeah. in not breaking people, especially women's bodies, into little components. Oh, I just deal with the cervix. I don't look at anything else. <laughs> oh, I just do HIV. I don't look at anything else. Women must be looked at in their comprehensive totality and do the life course approach, like you are saying. So we are learning from many of our partners. We're learning from the Global Fund on how to get communities. We're learning from Gavi about how to engage political leadership. I must confess and quote me, if you will, we are lagging behind. Really, we are lagging behind. And I would like for you to consistently challenge how we do business and teach us how to do business. Yeah. Because we really, really need to move from the true science, which is indeed the core normative business of WHO, to bringing science into communities. You know, life is not a randomized control trial. Life is life. And when it happens, mm -hmm. it happens. You know? So. Strengthen us, call us to order, and ask us next year, what have you done? So that we really, really must uh, stand up. I think it, speaking truth to power is something that I'm urging people here to really make real. We all want to hug you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no it's Thank the you. realities because it's I know right? for, what for being so truthful people yes. want to do. But thank you very much for the chance to be here. with real people. Thank, thank you, Nono. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And please continue to engage with us. We have our hashtag UHC for Communities, Help for All, WHA72, and this session will be available online. And thank you to all the partners. Um, and uh, uh, for the panelists, if we can just actually go.